It's uh, interesting. I just got a um, kind of a, a survey that I uh, that I kind of subscribe to and get occasionally. And this one was a, by the Barna Group, and it was uh, pertinent to our subject this morning uh, because the the question was asked or not um, whether Satan uh, is a living being or else just a symbol of evil. And uh, of this Barna Group, uh, done very recently, 2008, forty uh, percent said that Satan was just simply a symbol of evil and not an actual person. Uh, that's going to that's gonna give you problems uh, in the world in terms of spiritual warfare. It was um, C.S. Lewis uh, in the preference to his book, The Screwtape uh, Letters, that, uh, that makes reference to the fact that um, uh, that's exactly what the, the devil wants you to think. There he writes, the demons hail with delight the materialist who disbelieve of their existence. But uh, again, we're, we're as Christians in, in warfare. Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, uh, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of, of strongholds. So when he says war, that means war. When it says warfare, it means warfare. <laughs> it's, uh, there's, there's no uh, mystery uh, going on there. And uh, we are in a, in a battle. Though we, uh, uh, again, we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to, to the flesh. The way we take on the enemy and, and the spiritual warfare is not by physical or carnal means. It's through the means that Paul will very much describe for us when we talk about putting on the, the full armor of God. And that's where we'll, we'll get to uh, this, this morning. I wanted to read a, a couple of other things. One from uh, an author that says, uh, from evolutionary theory to Marxist philosophy, from uh, racial prejudice to multiculturalism, from gang violence to world wars, from the sexual revolution to AIDS, from broken homes to the violent crime epidemic, from alcoholism to drug addiction, Satan's work is evident. The hatred and violence, the death and destruction, the pain and the misery from the beginning of history until today are all large, due, uh, all large due to the degree of the activity of, uh, of the devil. And uh, I think it's us as believers that have a, a handle that we're actually uh, in a war and we sense the war at times with our, our own souls. And then we watch the, the news at night and man, you can just see the, the devil is at work all over the place in people's lives. And we see the death and the destruction and uh, and the despair in people's lives, and yet there's still so many around us that <laughs> don't even believe that, and they don't really understand what's, what's going on. Uh, the Apostle John said uh, in 1 John 5, 29, that the whole world lies in the power of the, uh, of the evil one. Uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, that we are to suffer hardship uh, uh, with him as a good soldier of Christ. Notice he mentioned we're soldiers, not basket weavers. And we're, we're supposed to be engaged in the battle. I think of the words of Jesus to, to Peter. He says that Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I've, I've prayed for you. And uh, anytime we begin, I think, to step out and begin to do something for the cause of Christ, which many of you are doing, and sharing your testimony, praying for others, being involved in ministry, or just being a witness uh, at school or in the workplace, you're going to run into some resistance. Uh, sometimes it's just tough to get to church <laughs> because of the resistance of, uh, uh, of the enemy. But uh, we're going to look at uh, six verses from uh, verse 10 to 16 this morning, and then we'll kind of continue on in the next couple of weeks. But I think, uh, as Paul uh, indicates here, very important subject. Verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, uh, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, 
and the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the, the gospel of peace. So the first thing we notice in the first couple of verses there in 10 to 12, there's an urgency to, to take a stand uh, that's uh, emphasized in the word finally. Again, in context, we're in Ephesians. Paul has laid out in chapter 1 the riches that we have in, in Christ. He's gone on and then spent quite a bit of time uh, making sure that we understand that we're saved by grace and by grace alone. And it's been uh, obviously a very important doctrine. Uh, he moves on into uh, to other areas that try to uh, go from doctrine to duty in terms of uh, what's happening in our homes and that our homes need to be, to be spirit-filled. And then describes uh, roles and responsibilities in terms of husbands and wives and children's uh, what it means in terms of being an employer and an employee and, and all these things that are, that are so important. But here with this word, he says, and finally, as if that's all very important, but you'd better understand this uh, in, in a sense or uh, not to say that that's meaningless, but, but there's, a, there's an emphasis here that finally, finally, even after everything I've said, please make sure you, you understand this. Uh, and he says that, Secondly, there's an urgency to stand and to stand in, uh, in, in power. And, um, and we're not going to be able to stand in, in our own power, certainly. We're going to be able to and want to stand in, in the power of God. And again, there's two dangers here. You can be like that. Uh, I don't know who they were surveying that said they were Christians, but that 40% of the Christians that either strongly disagreed or somewhat disagreed with the idea that Satan is even a real person. Uh, and again, the number went up a little bit when asked about demonic entities and whether they can influence you one way or another. There's a lot of people that, that say they're Christians that don't even believe that that, that happens. And certainly uh, that's an extreme. Uh, there would be the other extreme that... Uh, that basically would, would uh, over-spiritualize or give Satan too much credit. You know, every time a, a gate creaks, it's because there's a demon in it, you know, and you, you know kind of a thing. And uh, you know what I mean? I'm just giving an illustration, but uh, we want to balance in all this to not give Satan too much credit, but certainly to realize that he is out there and, uh, and he has a plan for our lives as, uh, as well. And it's an urgent, uh, it's urgent that we take a stand uh, but again, it's in the power of God. Ephesians 1, if you were just to go over a few pages in chapter 1 there in verse 18, Paul says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. <clears throat> Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So we're to stand, but again, the stand is urgent, and it's in God's power. None of us could, we wouldn't do well taking on Satan. He is a, uh, a tremendous adversary, one of, one of uh, God's uh, most powerful created beings in, ter in terms of the angelic order. And when he fell from heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. And we are no match for them. But he is no match for us with God's spirit in us. Greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. Uh, and we take our power from him. And Paul says... I transfer my weakness and whatever I may have to offer, and I exchange it for, for Christ's power. Uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. As long as I think I can do it, I'm in trouble. As long as I see my weakness and I claim that I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my lives, then I've made that exchange and I can take a stand uh, against the enemy. But again, it requires our involvement in standing. Uh, James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. So again, is the resisting and submitting something we do or something the Lord does? No, it's something we do. It's, we, we have to be involved in, in, in the process. First Peter 5, 8, be self-controlled and alert. 
Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of, of suffering. And uh, it's so important that, uh, that we stand. It's important for our own sake, uh, for, our, for our families. It's important for the kingdom of God, because when we don't, we discredit the name of Christ and the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Satan takes us down... And uh, he is able to then discredit. Think about uh, David and the Bathsheba. What was said afterwards is that the, the enemies of God were rejoicing at, at what had happened. Were blaspheming God as a result of his sin with, with Bathsheba. And it's the same with us. It's very important. We don't, we don't want to fall. Uh, we don't want to fall into temptation. Uh, we don't want the destruction and the despair that comes to our lives. But it's, uh, it's, even, it's even bigger than that. Our testimony for the gospel will be effective. So there's an urgency in taking a stand. And secondly, there's a warning against the scheme. And, uh, and we've mentioned this before in messages, but the scheme is a particular plan. Scheme denotes craft, deceit, a cunning device. And we, again, need to be very careful that we don't underestimate the power and the ability of, of Satan. And we're going to talk more in a moment about the idea of his primary access is, is really through, through our minds. And uh, I, I don't know if you've walked with the Lord long enough to be able to tell, you know, when you're under attack. Uh, I, I think as a new believer or a young believer or... Maybe if you don't have a lot of Bible knowledge or thought about it very much, you, you, you may just be totally un unaware. It's just that your wife is so grouchy now, you don't know what's going on. You know, I mean, you know, we, we, there's a lot of times when we're just getting hammered. I don't know what's up with my boss because he was never like that before, you know, and it's, you know, and we, we don't even realize, you know, what's, what's going on sometimes and that we need to be on our knees. We need to be, uh, to be in, uh, in prayers. A couple of weeks ago, I, I woke up at three or, three or four in the morning, which is always a delight. <laughs> and, uh, but I woke up sweating profusely, having come out of a very, a very horrible dream. And uh, I, it's like I, you kind of come to and go, okay, <laughs> that was just a dream, you know, and it's like your heart's pounding and stuff. And I, I hesitated, you know, I thought for just a moment about, should I, you know, am I going to be able to go back to sleep? And then I, and then, and then I just had the realization that this was totally from the pit of hell, what, what was in my mind. And I just needed to begin praying and praying pretty fiercely for, for some time before I could sense the peace of God and try to go back to sleep. There's just, Satan will come in all kinds of ways through, through your mind to bring oppression to us. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have God's Holy Spirit in us. Uh, we cannot be, uh, that's a, a false doctrine and teaching that a believer can be possessed uh, by, uh, by Satan or uh, by a demonic, demonic entity, but certainly uh, he comes after us sometimes. Uh, and we need to be very, very careful and realize he comes with crafty intent, with deceit. And he comes with a particular plan. Uh, in, in, uh, in Job, and that Job's a, a classic example in a sense of uh, uh, our look into, into the heavenlies. You got Job, he's rolling along. He's a righteous guy. He's praying for his kids in the morning, interceding. Apparently a generous guy and well thought of. And the Lord's blessed him and everything. And what we see, in, we're allowed in that passage of scripture, which is so helpful to see this heavenly scene. And what's going on up there uh, is a conversation. Have you considered my servant Job? Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? And then, and then Satan goes on and basically says, yeah, considered him. I know all about him. I've been stalking him. I've been watching him. Why don't you remove that hedge about him and let me at him? Well, what would you do? I have a plan. I'll tell you exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to attack him this way, this way, this way, and this way. The devil has a scheme, Paul says. It's a particular plan. It's not a generic plan. It's for each and every one of us through, again, Satan is not omnipresent. He's just one, one individual, one personality, but he has his minions that, that, are, that are out there uh, around the world. 
And, uh, and they come to us and they stalk us and they watch us. Again, the illustration we've used before that's really frightening to me of, of David. That David could be the young shepherd boy who worships God and so forth, defeats Goliath, becomes a general in the army, eventually becomes the king of the nation of Israel, uh, eventually moves the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem because he wants worship to be uh, the center of the nation and so on and so forth. And, and all along, Satan is watching. Uh, 10 years go by, 20 years go by, 30 years go by, 40 years go by, and he's watching and he's stalking and he's waiting. And then one day, in one moment, then David is on his rooftop, Bathsheba is below in eyesight, no coincidence, and David sees, and then through his mind, through the eye, he lost, and then he's, you know, brought into this temptation, and we know the story, he falls. Satan is very patient. It's a particular plan, and he is very patient. Well, how do we know when it's going to happen? You don't. So we have to, every day, put on the full armor of God and assume that today could be the day that he's going to bring this attack. Again, think of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. And we know that Satan comes to him there in what we refer to as the temptation. And, and of course, uh, as he brings these temptations to Jesus, Jesus defeats them with what Paul describes as the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, a particular word for a particular situation. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus defeats Satan in an example to teach us and to show us. And what does Satan do? He says, at that time, Satan left him for a more opportune time. It wasn't done. He's coming again. But he's going to stay. He's going to watch. And he's going to wait. I think we can assume there may have been other times, certainly when he came on the offensive against Jesus, uh, the one time that we see it really highlighted again would be certainly in the Garden of Gethsemane in that prayer time of, uh, of Jesus. But there's a particular plan. It's a scheme. It means there's crafty intent. The second part, the scheme is part of a conspiracy. Look at verse 12 again. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Paul uses the same language in Colossians 2.9. For in Christ all the full, fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Down in verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So there's, there's authorities out there, and they're apparently in some kind of a ranking kind of order. We see sometimes that um, after having a difficult week or a tough day, man, the devil was all over me today. Well, in reality, he probably wasn't. Satan himself is probably visiting one of our good friends like Kim Jong-il or Mahmoud Ahmadinejad or some mover or shaker in the world. I mean, he's only one guy. He can only be in one place at uh, one time. But there is a conspiracy in the scheme. There are other powers. There are other authorities. There are other rankings. Think about Daniel 10. When, when Daniel is praying and an angel comes to, with answer to Daniel's prayer and tells Daniel, the moment you prayed, your prayer was heard at the throne of God. I've been delayed in getting here because I was met by resistance. But Michael came, more powerful. We overcame. Here's the answer to your prayer. There was, a, in that passage, again, a glimpse into the heavenly realm where through prayer, what happens if Daniel doesn't continue in prayer? Do they win the battle in the heavenlies? I don't know, but the indication is that in that battle, there's a lot of what goes on that is tied directly to our prayers and our intercession, and certainly that'll be the last thing we cover is this idea of, of prayers and petitions and how important it is in spiritual warfare. There's a conspiracy. It's a particular scheme, and then the scheme primarily attacks our, uh, our minds. And, um, and certainly, as we mentioned with David, the, the, the attack could come through the eye gate or the ear gate, but, uh, but basically it's internal. Uh, in verse 12, when it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, uh, in a Greek text, literally, it says, the struggle in us is not against flesh and blood. Again, it's not an external struggle. It's an internal struggle, and it is primarily in the mind. Paul will mention uh, often to bring every thought captive in submission to Jesus Christ. You know what I'm talking about? That, that, this, is where, this is where it's all, all going on. 
uh, a lot of the time. That's where the attack is coming from. That's what the scheme in, uh, involves. Listen to 1 Corinthians 21.1. It says there of David, then David, excuse me, then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now God had told David, don't number the fighting troops. Trust me, you've got enough. Let me be your strength, your power. Doesn't matter how many troops you've got, I'll be your protection. Don't number the troops. But Satan rose up and, and basically got David to do this, which brought some horrible consequences uh, as, as a result if you read the passage. But how did Satan move David? Here. <laughs> he didn't show up in a pitchfork in a, in a red jumpsuit saying, hey, I think you really ought to do this. You know, it was, it's, it's crafty, it's deceitful, it's much more, it's much more subtle. Uh, John 13, 2 there of Judas Iscariot. The devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. It's, again, the ancients, the heart was equivalent to the, to the mind. There's where the attack primarily comes to. I want to go through four uh, examples. It's not an all-inclusive list of how the Satan comes in a, and brings the attack to our mind, but uh, maybe it'll just help us kind of think through this. One of the ways that he brings the attack internally in us is through condemnation. Condemnation. Uh, he's uh, pretty good at it. And especially if we don't clearly understand the gospel, we don't clearly understand our position in Christ, uh, which uh, a lot of Christians don't. And this attack is very successful because after all, we all pretty much sin on a regular basis. So he's got, he's got some fodder there. He's got something to kind of work, work with. And he's able to come stalking, watching, being patient to be able to come and you call yourself a Christian. I saw what you did. People know what you did. If they, or if people knew, then they wouldn't respect you anymore. You think God will answer your prayers? You, and and, this, and, the, and, the, and the, the weight comes on, the condemnation, the condemnation, which is, of course, designed to drive. It's an attack of the enemy. If you're being condemned in your mind because of some sin that you've been involved in, it's an attack of the enemy to drive you away from the cross, away from Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you of sin, he is showing your sin and he is driving you to the cross and to Jesus Christ so that you might be forgiven. That's how you can tell whether where the Holy Spirit's at work doing what he's supposed to be doing or if it's, you're just under, uh, under attack. The, uh, the second way is this idea of, uh, of fear. Satan will threaten us with all kinds of evil consequences if we trust and obey the Lord. He'll threaten us with, uh, quote, sudden destruction. He'll give us what we call the what ifs. In your mind begins, well, yeah, that could work out, but what if? And if that happened, what if this? And what, you know, the economy and what you could lose your, and what if you did lose your, and what if you, and, you know, and then fear. Fear comes into our mind. Uh, sometimes certainly there's natural reasons to have fear and so forth about certain things. But uh, we're talking about a spiritual attack that begins to weigh on our, our hearts and, and our minds. Um, anybody say he's pretty good at that one? Amen? <laughs> Especially with everything that's going on in the world around us. Think he's think Satan's having a good time with all this in terms of people's hearts and minds? Uh, I, I, think, I think he is. Uh, I read this, and I can't give the source for it, but I read it in one of my church history books. I thought it was interesting. Uh, when the 18th century revivalist George Whitfield called upon his friend John Wesley to take over his open-air preaching ministry, John was suddenly struck with the impression that if he were to do so, he would die. Having sought divine guidance by randomly opening his Bible on four different occasions, the scriptures seem to confirm uh, his, his fear of death. It's John Wesley, come on, you know. Whitfield's asking you to take over this, this huge ministry that he's got, uh, this open-air preaching, which is the, the new thing uh, in terms of church history at that time. Wasn't in the church, very controversial, but a lot of people were getting saved. Uh, and, and he takes his Bible and zzz, does the Russian roulette with your Bible thumb, you know, uh, you know, Judas hung himself, you know, go and do likewise, you know, so he, I don't know what four verses he came to, but they were confirming this uh, uh, overriding impression that he was going to die if he did this. Uh, and of course, uh, we know history 
Actually, it was through the acceptance of that invitation that John Wesley entered into his evangelistic career, which lasted more than 50 years and resulted in the conversion of tens of thousands in the forming of the, of the Methodist church. Satan can come in and, and try to keep us from walking with the Lord, serving the Lord, being as committed as we should. As, and again, especially, and I've seen it over and over again, when somebody begins to step out into ministry just a little, <laughs> they just get hammered. I mean, just the fear comes in. Uh, the what if, the condemnation, you're not, it's, it's, it's spiritual warfare. We need to see it for what it is uh, and, then, and then deal with it. Uh, again, fear can include evil thoughts, uh, imaginations. What do we do? Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things instead of, instead of those things. Do this instead of, instead of that. Uh, this brings up a very uh, interesting por uh, uh, point as well. Um, in a sense, what we're doing when we do that is we're taking out the shield of faith to, you know, intercept those, those darts that the enemy is uh, shooting at us. And we'll look at that next week and everything. But the point is, if you don't believe the truth of God's word, which really is the shield, you'll never take it out. Uh, so there's a sequence in putting on the armor and the, that first thing that we're going to look at, the belt of truth is very important. If you're not committed to the truth of God's word, you're in big trouble when it comes to, uh, to spiritual warfare, even as we saw in some of those statistics earlier. Uh, the third one is, uh, is depression. Maybe the most devastating of all the schemes of the devil because it gathers up condemnation, doubt, fear, evil thoughts, imaginations, wraps them in despair, leaves you with an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. This is not to say, and we'll look at it in a moment, it's not to say that everybody's depressed is under the attack of the enemy, but it is, it is a tactic. Uh, it is something that, uh, that he uses. And certainly, we see it in the life of David. He was a very, and can we just say that everybody goes through it? Is that to let everybody off the hook? You know, it's like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you if you, you struggle with depression from time to time. Are we okay? We all do that. David is one of the most godly men in, in, the, in the Bible. And you read the Psalms and, man, that guy's like manic. I mean, he, he, he's really struggled with depression. What did he do? He journaled. He poured his heart out to the Lord. That's, that's probably a, a, a good thing to do, apparently. Asop, also one of the great uh, psalm writers of, of the Bible, uh, apparently struggled with this, Psalm 77. My soul refused to be comforted. When I remembered God, then I am disturbed. When I sigh, then my spirit grows faint. Thou hast held my eyelids open. I am so troubled, I cannot speak. Now, he goes on in the psalm, and it's a, it's a beautiful psalm, and he talks, uh, and you can look at the first part of, of Psalm 77, and if you're an underliner, underliner, every time he says, I, 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 and then he hits a passage, and he says, and then I entered the sanctuary of the Lord, and then, and then all of a sudden, you start underlining, there's not too many eyes, and everything is the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, when he came in. That's, that's what he did. All of that to say is that it is sometimes, not every time, sometimes uh, it's an attack of the enemy. Paul struggled at, at times. 2 Corinthians 1.8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we even despaired of our, our life. And we could think about Elijah when after he defeats the, uh, the priest of, of Baal, he hears that uh, Jezebel is going to, uh, you know, kill him and everything. And he runs the marathon, 20-something miles. That'll take it out of you. And then, and then he basically says, uh, you know, just kill me, God. It's, it's, it's all over. Uh, struggling. Listen to Sp Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, again, probably the prince of preachers and uh, arguably maybe uh, influencing more, more preaching and pastors and then than maybe anybody else through his school initially, then through his writings and so forth, but a tremendous man of God uh, historically. Uh, and he says this at one point, I of all men am perhaps the subject of the deepest depression at times. Depression so fearful, I hope none of you ever get such extremes of wretchedness as I go through. It's like, Wow. And this is a guy that had a basement full of people praying by the hundreds every time he was up preaching. And so that was the power 
of what happened up there. Uh, all the prayer support in the world, but it doesn't mean he didn't come under attack in this area. Apparently he did. And uh, basically four, four ways that, that we might suffer uh, depression. And, uh, and I, I mention this because it's, it's epidemic uh, in, uh, in, our, in our own culture. And uh, in many others, like in Japan, it's, it's rampant. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very troubling thing. It's a very, a very big issue. And there's lots of speculation as to the reasons and so forth. But one, sometimes it's organic. It's hormonal. It's fatigue. It's, it's something physical. Get a checkup. Sleep. Eat a couple of good meals. I mean, uh, maybe you need some help in, in that area. Maybe it's some kind of uh, chemical imbalance. has to do with hormones and what you're going through at the time or whatever. It's just organic. It's not a spiritual attack. It's just, it's just something purely physical that can be resolved. Praise God. Sometimes it's circumstantial. The problems of life just, just get you down. I mean, just, man, you watch the news. There's just horrific things that go on. I mean, it seems like, is it just me or is it seems like every day somebody takes a gun and kills like six or eight people and kills himself? That, that used to be like, I was like, oh, I can't even believe that happened. It's like, it's like three or four times a week now. I don't know if the news reporting is getting better or if it's just that the world we're in is just getting more bizarre. I think it's just getting more bizarre out there. Um, you can watch the news and just, uh, but when it comes into your life, when it's your family, your friends that it's happening to, hey, circumstances. We can go through great depressions just, just grieving over the loss of, uh, of family members and so forth. It's not a satanic attack. It's just your body sometimes saying, stop, get off the merry-go-round, take a break, rest, contemplate, go through what you're, what you're going through. It's okay. But there are, there are times, though, when three, it's sin-related. Uh, you're undergoing a depression because you're in a habitual place of sin. And you know better and God is showing you, and you, you won't repent. You won't deal with it. You won't take any steps. You won't kind of come, come clean with it, confess it, change. Uh, and, and, and you're suffering the consequences of it. And, and you are ripe and open for an attack of the enemy at, at, at that point in time. And the fourth time, the thing is that what we've been alluding to is, uh, is again, just it's a, it's a satanic thing. It's just an attack. In the mind, you know, depression, like fear and so forth, is just one of those ways the enemy can attack us. And we need to be able to realize when it's, when it's happening the best we can. And again, I always default to uh, the James passage, if anyone lacks wisdom, then ask God and he will give it without finding fault. You don't have to do something first. Just ask him, show me what's going on here. Is this an attack? Is this what I'm going through? Do I need to talk to somebody? Is this something I need to just pray about? But it's a way, it is a way that the enemy attacks us uh, through our minds. The f and again, this is not exhaustive. These are just some of the ways, some of the examples. And the fourth one is uh, something we would uh, uh, be f more familiar with, temptation, the solicitation to do, to do evil. We see it, it certainly with David, we mentioned with Matthew chapter 4 with Jesus. And uh, Satan comes to attack us and to tempt us. Why? Because he hates us. If you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, then you are going, you are the Lord's. You are his child. He loves you. He's poured his grace out upon you. You're going to be with him forever in heaven. You now become a witness of that grace to a lost and a dying world. And he hates you for it. And so he is your enemy in one of his dominions. He has a specific scheme. He comes and he will attack. And often that attack is through the mind and it's through temptation often. We need to learn to identify the temptation because Satan is subtle. He can appear as an angel of light, a damsel in distress, a solution to your financial problems or an answer to your, your poor self-image. And the list goes on and on. But we just need to we need to kind of just grow up in our uh, uh, maturity as a believer and, and realize, begin to realize when we're, what's happening here. You know, my boss is, it's not just that my boss is grumpier, there is something going on. And I need to be able to understand it so that I can, uh, I can deal with it. 
It's like, well, how do I really know for sure? Well, with what you're doing, are you tempted to rationalize what you're doing? Are you sensing that it's kind of a compromise, you know, what you're doing? If you're feeling any of those kinds of things and it's in direct contradiction to the Word of God, then you're being <laughs> tempted and you need to realize it for what it is. Uh, secondly, there's a warning, uh, again, again, against this scheme. Uh, I need to exchange my weakness for the power of God to overcome it. Paul is about ready to tell us how to do that in terms of putting on the full uh, armor of God. And, uh, and we need to realize as we go through this that uh, Paul is a guy that had a tremendous military ministry. <laughs> I mean, he was chained to these guys all the time, took trips with them, you know, took ocean trips with them, horseback riding with military. He was with these guys a lot. As a, as a uh, prisoner of Rome, they have these guys as escorts. And, uh, and you can imagine being chained to an eight-hour shift to the Apostle Paul. And uh, you think maybe he just tried to witness these guys just a little bit. And, of course, we know from the book of Romans at the end, he's kind of given his greetings and goodbyes and, and mentions those in Caesar household, greet them, you know. And he's mentioned, we know that, we know that many of the military guys uh, get saved under Paul's ministry. But uh, Paul, with them for so long, is very familiar with their, their uniform and their dress. And so he now is going to take that model of a Roman soldier as a metaphor to try to tell us, how do we do this? Okay, we realize it's going on, so how do we fight the fight? If our weapons are not carnal, they're not physical, they're spiritual, what are they? And, uh, and I have to tell you as we go through this is that in a sense, Paul tells us and he doesn't tell us. And as he tells us, like for example, he may have been changed to a Roman soldier and he just says, my, he says, you know, that the red, the red feathers <clears throat> on your helmet there, that, that reminds me of the blood of Christ. Well, that's like the helmet of salvation. Can I explain to you what salvation is? You know, and, and basically, that's a nice breastplate. That protects your vital organs. Hey, that's like the breastplate of righteousness. Can I tell you about the righteousness I have in Jesus Christ? Now, see, I'm just speculating, but he names these things and says what they are. And in a sense, how we apply them is we just kind of uh, figure it out. And uh, so I want, I want to tell you, I don't, I don't have the corner on this. You can write, read five books on this passage and very often get five different interpretations, but certainly there's some, there's some main things that we can grasp from what he's saying, and that's what I'm going to attempt to do. So there's an urgency to take a stand. There's a warning against the scheme. There's weapons of a soldier we must possess, and we're going to look at two of those. And the first one is in verse 13 and 14, God's soldier will, will wear the belt of truth. Now, the Roman soldier that Paul would be looking at wore a, a, a large leather belt, and it served uh, several different functions. Uh, for one thing, it would hold his sword. For another thing, there was a place where he could slide his spear into it uh, so that uh, he didn't have to bear the full weight of it when they're uh, on these marches and, and so forth. And we'll look at that next week, the uh, the, uh, the forced marches that the Roman soldiers would do in order to uh, uh, catch their enemies off guard. Uh, they also were on that belt somewhere commendations from previous battles. And uh, like uh, uh, when uh, men and women in the military today, when they're more of a formal uh, class A's or whatever they've got, they've got those ribbons, they've got all the pins. And, and if you know what to look for, it, it tells a story, where they've been, what they've done, kinds of assignments, achievements. It's uh, it's, it's all there. The Roman soldier would wear uh, that, that kind of thing. It was out on the, uh, the base here on Wednesday and invited out again uh, by Captain McAlexander, who's that Navy captain that runs the chapel uh, out there. And the first time I, I, met, uh, I met him, I, <clears throat> I noticed uh, that, uh, that he had a jump pin on, that he had, he had gone to jump school, and I, and I, which is, I thought pretty unusual for a chaplain. And, uh, and I said, uh, Captain Captain, uh, is there a story with that jump in, sir? I, I, I never met a chaplain. It's been to jump school. He goes, there's a story, all right. I was 40 years old. I can tell you, 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 you drop faster as you get older. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me the whole story, how he got into jump school and what it was like and so forth. But I, I knew that just from seeing a pin on him. And if you know what to look for, the Roman soldier had those kind of commendations. His rank, who he was, how experienced, 
the battles he had been in. So uh, it served a lot of purposes uh, uh, for him that were functional that got him to the battle. But most importantly, when he got to the battle, that belt served the purpose of holding up his mumu. Now, they didn't really wear mumus, but they wore togas, right? And, you know, so you've, you've, we've seen enough Hollywood stuff to know what, what that looks like. And before they, as they went on the march, if they were really moving quickly, and once they, certainly they got to the battle, I don't know if you've seen them do it in the movies, but basically they, they grab that from the bottom up and they pull it up and they tuck it in the belt very tightly. And it looks like they've got a pair of shorts on at that point. You'd never see a Roman soldier go into the battle with his toga hanging at his ankles, I can tell you that, fighting the enemy. Hang on, I can't really get my footing here. I've got, you know... No, I mean, he's, he, he really can't engage until that happens. Without the belt, he really cannot engage the enemy. The belt is critical, and it's first. It's the truth. If we're not committed to the truth of God's word, and, that, and that's a big issue, right? People are like, oh, you know, truth is relative. What's true for you may not be true to me. If you have that philosophy as a Christian, you're toast, <laughs> I don't know how you defend yourself against the enemy. Well, I'm not sure he's alive. Uh, I think he's doing a pretty good job on you. The, you know, we're, 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 we're in big trouble. Uh, we have to be committed to the truth of God's word if we're going to take a stand against the enemy. If I've got to believe God's word for what it is. I've got to believe that Jesus Christ is truth uh, in, incarnate. So it's a, it's a commitment. I, uh, when I think about this, I think about a, another belt. When I was still building uh, stained glass windows, uh, I would uh, need to hire uh, finished carpenters, different guys over the years, usually brothers, and uh, they would help on, on bigger jobs and, and everything. But uh, Pete was in the first service, so I was uh, embarrassing him and using him as an example. But whether it was Pete or my good friend uh, Paul Mossman, or, or like, uh, and I've watched Christian do it too. Uh, they're all the, they're all the same way. A guy that's a pretty good a good finished carpenter. It's interesting. We'll drive up, trucks there, tools are there. I'm like, clock is ticking. Let's let's get going here. You know, I paid a lot of money for the scaffolding and all three of you guys. Let's let's get this done. You know, uh, the businessman mind is <laughs> is clicking in here, and uh, but they're all the same way. It's like they get out. Pencil behind the ear, measure, 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 look in the truck, come back, look again, look at the lumber we got, come back. And then finally, finally, they go to their truck, and when they, if they put their belt on, we're on the clock now, we're working now. Uh, they're not going to do anything until they know they've got everything they need, they've got all the materials, they've got every tool, every access point, they've got power, they've got, they're ready to go. When they put that belt on, Every one of them, it's the same way. It's like, I know we're working, this is happening, they're committed, and they're not going to commit until that, that point in time. I just say that to help us remember, the belt of truth, this big leather belt, is a commitment to the truth, and we don't stand a chance against the enemy if we're not committed to the truth. Uh, the second aspect of this word speaks of sincerity, which is a very interesting word in, uh, that Paul uses in the Greek language. It means without wax. And I don't know if you've ever heard the explanation of this, but in that day, if you went into the marketplace to buy a, a pot or a cup or anything, uh, you know, you, today if you, if you bought, went to a craft fair and you bought a, a handmade pot, you would, oh, it's handmade. We're going to put it on the shelf right here. It's beautiful. But in those days, it all was handmade. So, you know, it was just everyday utensils. And, uh, and so they would, they would pick it up. And one of the things they would look for is they would hold it up to the light and look through it to make sure it's going to hold water, that it's going to hold liquid. There's no cracks, there's no crevices. Well, the potter, you know, he's labored over this thing, making it, you know, putting it on the wheel, you know, forming it. He's already fired it. He's already come back, fired it a second time with a glazed coat, and he holds it up to the light too. And if he sees a little crevice, he could take out a piece of wax, similar color, and to fill in the crevice <laughs> so that when you look in, in the light, it looks good to you, but it has wax. It's not sincere. It's not really true. It's false. There's some deceit there. We've got to be committed to the truth if we're going to stand uh, against the enemy. So again, the visual is good, the belt, because that Roman soldier, when he does that, the belt is what gets it all together. It holds up his toga, 
It's a place for his sword. It's a place for his spear as he marches. And the truth is what helps us get it all together uh, against the enemy. And it's got to be sincere. It's got to be without wax. The second uh, part of this is God's soldier will wear the breastplate of, uh, of righteousness. Some say maybe the most important uh, part of the armor because it would uh, cover his vital organs. On a Roman soldier, the, uh, the, the breastplate was not a solid piece. Uh, it was it's more like those King Arthur movies, the mesh you know, you know, so he had movement uh, uh, in everything. Roman soldiers were very high tech, you know, for, for their day. Uh, the idea here in the breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness, two things. Certainly we are, we're given a righteousness in Jesus Christ. It is, uh, Paul says, his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us when we come to, to faith. That means it's given to us. That's why we can pray and have direct access to, to God. Because, not because of our own righteousness. Isaiah 64 says, our own righteousness is like filthy rags. Paul says that there is none, in Romans 3, there is none righteous, no, not even one. So the righteousness we have is what has been given to us in Jesus Christ, and it cannot be taken away. Positional righteousness, we call that. At the same time, Paul, other New Testament writers are very clear that we are, as believers, called to a life of holiness. We would call that practical righteousness. And, uh, and here's how it works. When, when I'm not living that out, when there is a pattern of sin in my life that I'm not dealing with, in my righteous breastplate, there is now a chink in the armor. There's a place where the enemy knows that's... It's, it's a small sin, it's small sins, but that's a place I can attack. That's where I can come in at. And the other thing to know is that with this breastplate, it was designed to prevent them from being attacked by a particular type of sword. There were two swords that they used and they came up against. One was called the broad sword, and that's, uh, it's the really big one that you would hold with two hands. And uh, if you had that baby, you're kind of like the kamikaze guy, you know, because you, you're kind of open, you know, I mean, you, no shield, no nothing. And, uh, and it was designed for a particular type of attack. But in most hand-to-hand -hand combat, a Roman soldier and somebody he would fight would have another kind of sword called a machaira. And it's like a long dagger, narrow and long. And in that, with his shield, that hand-to-hand -hand combat, if he saw that his opponent had a little opening in that breastplate somewhere, he could put it right in and the battle's over. It hit an internal organ that guy would be, would be dead. In our fight against the enemy, he is looking for an opening. He's looking for a chink in our practical righteousness. So how do, how do we deal with that? Well, 1 John 1, 9. You know, again, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of all unrighteousness. I need to, on a regular basis, on a daily basis, do I know when the attack's going to come? I don't know. So I need to be ready all the time. Now, there are things in my life, things that I know, I'm blowing it here. Bible's very clear. It's not a mystery. I'm doing this. It says to do this. I got issues. I'm losing it here. Anger, whatever it might be, things are going. I need to bring that before the Lord. I need to confess it before the Lord. And he will forgive me, and he will cleanse me, and he will wash me, and that hole in my armor will, will be sealed up. I will not be at a place where I'm now vulnerable to attack. Because you know, Jesus said, it's the small foxes that ruin the vineyards. It's, you know, Satan is just, he's not looking for the death blow right off the bat. He's just looking for a beachhead. <laughs> he's just looking for a landing, a place to come in. And then from there, he can begin to exploit us in, uh, in other ways. Uh, and we need to be very careful. Again, uh, 1 John 1, 8 to 10, wonderful passage. It's not a magic wand. I, I know people that think it's a magic wand. They can live any way they want, sin any way they want. They take out the magic wand of 1 John 1, 9 and go, oh, God's forgiven me. It's, it doesn't work that way. When we come before the Lord, it should be with some contrition, with a broken heart. Lord, I've sinned against you. I've brought disgrace to you. I beg you to forgive me. Will you forgive me? We're just assuming he's righteous, he's good, you know, and uh, he's loving he, like he's got to. We need to come asking. 
to keep our, our, our fellowship with him. Are we still his son, still his daughter, even in sin? Absolutely. But we're like the prodigal son that needs to run back and be embraced by the father and, and be forgiven and be sincere, and he will forgive. Jerry Bridges has a, kind of a classic book called The uh, Pursuit of Holiness, uh, and, uh, uh, and in it, there's a wonderful illustration that I think helps out, because that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about pursuing after a, a, a righteous life, the breastplate of righteousness, so we're not vulnerable to the, en the enemy. And in the book, he, in the opening, he has an illustration of a farmer who's going to till the ground and do his best. Uh, and then he's going to sow his seeds, and he's going to get everything ready to go. And that's all that he can do. Now he has to wait. Will the rain come? Will germination take place? Will those sprouts come up? He can only do what he can do, but in a sense, God's laws of nature have to kick in at some point in time. And, and there are things we can do. Again, it's the Holy Spirit that's really working in us to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, and I'm so thankful for that. It's not my strength, it's his power, it's his work that, that he's bringing in us, but there certainly might, I still need to be digging up the ground and sowing the seeds and then trusting the Lord. Uh, so, so very important. Paul says in uh, 2 Timothy 2.22, to flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Did you notice that? Pursue righteousness. Peter says that very similar in 1 Peter 1.13. Again, uh, every piece of the armor, though, you'll note there's kind of a sequence, and you'll also note that it's all based on a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, re I really don't know the truth apart from, from coming to know the truth, Jesus Christ. I, I, re I have no righteousness of, of, of my own. The helmet of salvation is, is meaningless. I, I only know it through a, through a relationship with, with Jesus Christ. Uh, it's all so intricately tied together. Paul in, in, current, in Colossians 1.13, just one last verse and then we'll close. He says, uh, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Jesus Christ has rescued us. That, uh, that word uh, uh, brought is used of a king who's had a great victory. And now all of those that, uh, that were uh, formerly estranged in a way, he has brought them near with him. It's part of the spoils. We're part of the spoils. He's, he's defeated Satan. Jesus made an open spectacle of them on the cross. Uh, greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. God's given us everything so that we don't have to be beat up by Satan. We turn our, we give God our weakness in exchange for, for his strength that he gives to us by his grace. But there's still a part for us to play, to put on the, put on the armor. Uh, in World War I, there was a, a battle called the Battle of Jutland where the British fleet for the first time engaged the, the German, German Navy. And uh, the British naval engineers thought they had done a good job in terms of their ships. They doubled the armor all the way around the sides so they could take more of a blow in terms of the shelling and so forth. And, and once the battle got on, one thing became apparent right away is that they had missed something because uh, uh, their ships were going down one after another. And, uh, and very quickly, uh, the British Navy took what they had left and retreated and got out of there. Their shells didn't seem to hardly do anything to the British ships, and their, and their boats were just sinking rapidly. The, uh, the, na the uh, British naval engineers then <laughs> got together and realized where they made their mistake. Uh, they, it this wasn't like Pirates of the Caribbean. You pull up next to the guy and he's shooting at you that way. I mean, they're shooting shells that take flight and then lose trajectory, and they drop straight down, gravity helping them right into the deck. The British ships were, were, had the double steel on the hulls, and their decks were made out of wood. And so they went right, right through the deck and you know, just uh, exploded and, and sank the whole thing. The German decks were, were, were steel all the way, even on the deck. So uh, they, they seemed uh, impervious to what was going on. Uh, they weren't really fully armed for the battle. And, and they paid a tremendous consequence as a result of it. And so will we. So will we. Unless we really take this serious and realize it's a battle. Now, the reason I'm going through this is because I think God's doing some incredible things through the church and through our lives. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and it is exciting. I mean, and I get, to hear, I get to hear all the stories of the kids in Sunday school that are praying to receive Christ and with their parents at home and the things that are going on, some good things in marriages and different things. And, uh, and it's exciting. And I think we're really ticking off the enemy. <laughs> So I, I think we need to do, you know, even though we may have been through this, I just think it's an appropriate time that we go, yeah, that's right, you know, and we kind of, yeah, I'm going to put on my armor. I'm going to be ready for this, you know. It's not like, you know, we're going to go home and, and shake in the corner and, and hope the enemy doesn't find it. That's, that's not the idea here. Greater is uh, he that is in us than he that is in, in the world. And, uh, and we need to really, really understand that. I'm going to go over and tell just one, one more story. A number of years ago when I went to India, we, were, uh, we had a day in Calcutta. And so we went and visited, I was with Mike Stengel, we went and visited uh, Mother Teresa's, one of her, her uh, places of ministry there and stuff. But also in, in Calcutta is, the, is Kali's Temple, who is a very evil demonic entity, Kali's Temple. They still do blood sacrifices there. And Mike, you got to see this. You see, and he says, see it? He goes, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, it's, they do blood sacrifices. You, I mean, you'll see the whole thing right here. This is not Hollywood. This is the real deal. You got to see it at least once. Okay. And uh, so, then, so then he's telling the three Indian pastors that we've been traveling with, we're going to go to Kali's temple. And they're like, no, we're not. They're like, you know, they're not going to go near it. I mean, they're, they're afraid to go, to go near it. As, they're pastors. They're believers. We just came from a missions conference. And I've been traveling with these guys for a week. And Mike basically had to kind of start going through some of the scriptures that we've been going through. No, no. Kali can't do anything. To, we're, we're God's children. We have the Holy Spirit. We're going to disrupt. We're going to ruin it for him. We're going to walk in there as believers. Uh, demons are going to be freaked out at us because we're going to walk in and just see what's going on. Hey, let's pray while we're in there. We'll just really mess up the whole day for them, you know. And they're like, Brother, can we do that? Yes. <laughs> yes, brother. We sure can. And we did. Uh, it, was, it was a very interesting experience. But I just remember standing on the streets and Mike going through this because we need to be convinced once in a while. that uh, we. By the way, we win in the end. I don't know if you read the end of the chapter yet, but uh, uh, we're on the side of victory here. And uh, so it's good. It's good to understand this so that we can know when the attack is coming. Amen. Amen.